Welcome back to another episode of Winning Calls with Oracle. This is a virtual Sale GP race viewing event. Uh, what happens here? We relive some of the most thrilling moments from the races that happen around the world and discover how high tech fuels high performance. I'm your host, Ed Lee, and the format of the show means that on each episode, our featured team pick a race from the Sale GP archive that we can then relive with commentary, an onboard director's commentary, if you like. Today, we're featuring the Japanese Sale GP team. So we've got the skipper and helmsman, Nathan Outridge, and the team's data analyst, Nobu Katori, who have chosen a race from San Francisco. Uh, this event took place back in May of 2019, and it's the first time that we featured this event, which is surprising as it was arguably one of the most dynamic from that first season. Uh, in the middle and at the end of the race, we'll be showing a conversation that I had with Nathan and the Japanese Sail GP team's new flight controller, Leo Takahashi. Uh, there's some fascinating insight comes out of that, so make sure you stick around. Uh, but first, uh, Nathan and Noble will be talking us through their race, and we'll get to hear about the decisions that they made out on the water and how big data helped drive their winning calls during race two of the San Francisco Sail GP. If you're new to Sail GP, it's worth knowing that during each race, there are millions of data points that are streaming off hundreds of sensors on board each of the F-50s. They go up to the Oracle Cloud and then they come back down again to each team's data dashboard and also out to the Sail GP app in less than 150 milliseconds. It's less than the blink of an eye, so incredibly fast. But the key thing about this is that all of the F-50s are one design. They're exactly the same design and all of this data that's streaming off the boats is open stream so all of the teams can see each other's data so there are absolutely no secrets all of the teams can learn from each other Nathan Outridge, Nobu Katori, welcome to Winning Calls thank you so much for joining us uh, Nathan I'll start with you San Francisco is one of the most iconic sailing venues in the world. You know it so, so well. How excited were you about heading there for the second Sail GP event? Yeah, I think the, the San Francisco event was, you know, by far my, my favorite. I think the, the venue is, you know, so iconic. The, the weather there is great. And these boats are effectively designed to race on the San Francisco waters. And we had, um, you know, really flat water, good, strong breeze and a real opportunity to see what the boats were capable of. And, um, you know, coming off the back of Sydney where we had a good performance, but um, we didn't we didn't win. We were, we were very keen to make some steps forward. And I think a lot of the other teams were as well. And it, it ended up being, you know, quite an exciting event. And I think, you know, on the first day, there was any one of four boats that could win any races. And I thought that was a, a fantastic um, thing to be involved in. And, you know, I just can't wait to go back to San Fran. It's just such a cool place to sail. Interestingly, it's the first time that anyone's chosen to feature a San Francisco race. So I'm really excited about it as well. Uh, Nobu, from your perspective, you'd only just joined the Japanese Sail GP team in between the Sydney and San Francisco events. So it must have been a really steep learning curve for you in the build up to this event. Yeah, um, fortunately, I had a, you know, the work with the Nathan in the cup team in um, 2013 and 17, also Goops wing trimmer and then Paco all we know and then also Fuku I know been I, I known him for a long time so it's relatively easy to join in so that that is that helps me uh, you know uh, you know a lot and then at the same time the sail GP itself is really unique because no not so much sailing time so I really wondering you know I was wondering how can I help you know so uh that was challenging but uh you know first day obviously first day it's pretty good result so somehow i can contribute i believe i hope well i, I think the results on that first day speak for themselves you are probably the most valuable member of the team no but bit of lucky though <laughs> 
without further ado, let's get into the racing. And uh, once we can see this screen here, I'll talk you through it so you know exactly what you're looking at. Um, up on the top left hand side of this screen, you'll be able to see the race feed. So that's what everyone sees. Uh, on the bottom left hand side, that's the onboard camera from the Japanese F50. And then we've got all of this data here lined up on the right hand side. So you can see the ride time, the ride height, you've got the pitch of the boat, so the angle, uh, you've got the roll side to side, uh, you've got any penalties and then the distance to the leader. And then you've got the time down to the start there, one minute, eight seconds ahead of the start of the second fleet race in San Francisco with 20 knots of wind. It's, it's pretty much perfect conditions, Nath, isn't it? It was, you know, this day was awesome. And I think a lot of these races, you know, all stem from having a good start and you know, we had three good starts on this day and you know from memory you can see actually in in this picture where we're nowhere near the other boats and that was probably our strategy was you know, hit the start line with with boat speed and one of the things i remember we developed a lot was you know understanding of the race software and how that works and nobu was pretty crucial to us you know having confidence in our race software so if you stay away from the other boats and you trust your race software you, your time on distance can be really you know really accurate it's interesting you say that that was a theme you you in race one you'd taken the lured end of the mark and stayed away from everyone in this in this um race you're right up at the windward end of the mark well we, we just sort of wherever the pack was we tried to go the other end i think the line was very even and you'll see here at the gun our boat speed is you know over 40 knots at the gun we're a click late but we have enough runway to to really put the hammer down and, and roll over boats if you're in tight with all the other boats you're dictated by what they're doing whereas you know by being that windward boat and the british being the leeward boat you you're not getting bullied around a bit so you end up selling a bit more of your own race and as soon as you get your nose around the first boat here you can really put the bow down and you know you see we're doing 45 knots of boat speed here it's uh it's pretty hard to roll everyone on the first reach but if if you get your angle right and you can ride really high and um, the boats go really quick this was the key thing for me that you guys proved in San Francisco was just out and out boat speed in that drag race that we saw there, all six F50s absolutely fully powered up, drag racing to the first mark, and your boat speed was superior as it was around a lot of the course. What do you put that down to? What generated that boat speed? Well, we looked at a lot of the, the data after Sydney, and I remember asking um, nobody to give us a hand with that and saying, you know, what are the differences between us and the Australians? Because they were quite dominant there. And, you know, I remember the first report Nobu sent through was, you guys are just riding too low. You've got too much foil immersion. Um, if you get a little bit higher in the air, the boat should go quicker. So a lot of our training in San Francisco is about exploring that limit. And you can see there, you know, on the bottom picture, it's not a whole lot of foil in the water and that, that gives you speed, but you're also on the edge of control. And having a guy like Luke Parkinson um, really tuned into that, he was now flying the boat in San Francisco with the, the upgrades we had with the new flight control system um, meant that he could now fly the boat and um, you know I was more focused on driving it so you know downwind especially you know speed you know was coming a lot from how high we were flying and you can see here we're putting pressure on the British who are leading trying to get around them but it's pretty hard to go around them um, and you know we're just jibing here now to get onto the ley line and start to look at how do we, we attack on the upwind but I thought it was fantastic how close the fleets were you know on this first downwind and you start to see you know, everyone really pushing the boats quite hard by race two. Nobu, from your perspective, you, you've identified the ride height as a key point that'll make the boat faster. But you're also aware, I'm guessing, of how much risk there is involved in riding so hard. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. We uh, focus on the uh, basically Australian. And in this event, I think uh, the British is pretty fast. So we concentrate on comparing those to us. And then we found sort of uh, uh, Australian, uh, as uh, Nathan explained, the Australian, you know, flying high, but at the same time, stable sta stability of the height is really up or, you know, low, uh, big, which means risk and reward. So you have to, I mean, everybody knows that if flying high, you'll be faster but uh, at the same time, having a risk. So you have to control the uh, risk. So we sort of trying to capture those things. 
and to compare the uh, other. You, you've put some fantastic pressure on Dylan Fletcher up that first upwind leg there. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the upwinds all stem from how well you exit that bottom gate. And if you look back and, you know, we got a little bit inside them in the bottom gate. And the other big thing we learned was that the British were actually probably the fastest boat upwind out of all the competitors in the training. And again, we went to Nobu and said, well, what are they doing different to us? What is Chris Draper doing with the wing settings? What is Stu doing with all the foils? And it turned out they were running a little bit less twist, I think. Is that r right, Renobu? And so less twist meant they could sail a higher mode. So maybe maybe explain that a bit to that because I think it took us a while to catch on to what they were doing there. Actually, we uh, basically the uh, two biggest thing is the, the, uh, we captured the uh, attitude of the boat, which is pitch and then and right height, which is the you know biggest factor of the boat speed. Also try to capture the, the how they trim the wing, which is another factor. So uh, focus on those things and then comparing one to the other. And then we found that uh, the British is pretty f uh, high and they have the uh, high and fast, uh, high, high mode instead of us. So we're trying to match them, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to, the mo uh, to match their mode. So that's the uh, uh, upwind thing. And then downwind, I think Australian has the uh, higher, you know, the right height, which has the, uh, you know, more boat speed. But sometimes they, they have the uh, big jump. So we need to balance up that too. I think that's the conversation we had. So a dramatic start to race two of the GP event in San Francisco in 2019. We're going to take a quick break now, and it's my pleasure to welcome onto the show Leo Takahashi. He was grinder in the Japanese F-50 back in San Francisco, but he's been promoted to flight controller uh, for the second season. Uh, Leo, welcome to winning calls with Oracle. Um, for you as a young athlete, um, I mean, how important was it for you to get information from Nathan and also from Nobo in the preparation for that San Francisco race? Yeah, it was super important to have all the, the data and, uh, um, and the analytics after racing from Nobu. Uh, it just shows, um, you know, it just shows me how much, uh, well, obviously I was trimming the jib during that San Francisco event. And so, you know, it was important to see how it was, uh, the jib trim was different to the other teams. And uh, that, you know, made me, you know, change a few things for each race and, and for a new day. So that was super important to have that information coming through. And I mean, from your perspective, Nathan's obviously got a vast amount of experience in the F50, but for you, you'd had that very brief, it was quite a gusty light wind event in Sydney. Did it feel like a baptism of fire heading out on the bay in an F50 with 20 knots of very solid wind? Yeah, hundred percent, but uh, for sure, you know, having such an experienced team, it was uh, very good of Nathan to take it really slow for us in the first few days. Uh, obviously, Yuki's sailed the, the 50s before and uh, Nathan and Koobs and Parco and Nathan have done countless hours on the F50 also. So for me, I was a new one on board, but, you know, they were very calm and collective and we didn't do any, um, you know, intense or scary maneuvers when we first started off. So, no, I was very comfortable and, you know, I, I do I do love the thrill of trying out new things and, and so I was, um, I, no, I wasn't scared. So it was all sweet. Definitely <clears throat> a new thing, I imagine. Uh, Nath, from your perspective, yeah. if we delve into a bit more of the detail in the preparation for that race, you'd had less than an ideal um, preparation period. You'd had a couple of issues with the boat. How difficult was it from your perspective to, to really trust the boat when, when you weren't 100% sure of its performance? Yeah, the, 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 the F-50s are, a boat that you really need to grow confident in particularly in san francisco you need to you know be comfortable in how the boat's behaving how the wheel feels in your hands how the the wings behaving um and so you know all these boats have little gremlins all the time and so whenever you've got an issue with a part of your boat um you know the best thing to do is to stop and actually look at the data and go okay um you know we can see the wing is asymmetric today and we were having some issues controlling our wing in San Francisco. And we actually, you know, we had a bit of damage a few days before the racing began. So we were still just checking it all works. 
And one of the things that fascinates me out on the water, in terms of comparing all of the skippers, you're one of the most cool and calm, at least on the outside. Whenever we're watching the videos, you look very relaxed. Is that just a facade on the inside? Are you quite frantic? Or does the experience of having done that so many times mean that you're used to the process? It definitely comes with experience. You know, the first time anyone sails one of these boats, they're frantic on the inside and on the outside. You know, it's, it's quite an intimidating boat especially if it's windy. But if you're sailing with the same people regularly, and, um, you know, as Leo, you know, mentioned, Goobs Park and I did several years together um, when we were campaigning in the America's Cup with Artemis Racing. So, and, and further to that, Goobs and I have done three, you know, what have we done? About eight years, 49er sailing together. So um, you develop a relationship with your sailing partners, you get comfortable that they know what they're doing, you know what to expect from them. So everything just calms down. And so while things might be happening really quickly and it is quite intimidating, you're just relying on previous experiences to, to sort of navigate your way through difficult situations. Okay, uh, well, we're gonna get back into the racing now and see how that telepathy between all of the uh, Japanese crew on board played out in the second half of the race. But we'll be joining both of you, Leo, Nathan, afterwards for a few more questions. Thank you very much. Right now, time to get back into winning calls with Oracle. I'm fascinated by that idea of you've identified all of these issues in the data and, and ways that you can improve your performance, Nathan, but then putting those into practice. I heard people talking about cranking that ride high up which you did here and i think a lot of the the figures and the data show it you're almost 20 centimeters higher on average than a lot of the other teams but it's a bit like sprinting in high heels isn't it it's incredibly risky it's risky but you just need to have confidence in in your skills you know if you have confidence in how the flight control settings work and how the boat responds and if the driver and the wing trimmer and the flight controller are all in sync and have done a lot of time sailing together, you can you can push it further. And um, you know, I think we as as a group, you know, Goobs, Parker, and myself spent a lot of time sailing together um, when we were with Artemis. So we just felt more at home straight away. Whereas I think a few of the other teams were were striving, but often making small errors, and you see the wobbles come every now and then. But, um, you know, to, to touch on the differences, it was very clear to me that the British had a nice high mode upwind, the Aussies were low and fast, and we were just trying to explore the ranges and, and find a happy medium between the two. And you need to be able to do both modes, otherwise you, you can get left behind. We spent this whole beat on the hip of the British on starboard tack, always having to cling into a high mode. And we never got around them, but um, this is where the, the part of the race gets super interesting is you know, we, we put pressure on the downwind and um, you see here as we come around the top mark, you know, the boundary's not far away. You know, we talked about we're not going to be able to get around them by rolling them. So let's let's just fall in line here, try and close a bit of gauge and then jibe at the same time and then roll past them on port jibe because at least we'll be jibing back onto starboard at them. And, um, you know, so we hung with them upwind and then we just, you know, here we go, we jibe on the inside of them leading them back out to the pressure in the center. And this is where I said to Parker, I said, you've got to put the hammer down here, you know, jack the boat up as high as you can, get across their bow, and then let's go back into like sort of safety mode. So you put the turbo boost on, take the lead, and then you go back into managing your speed again. And that's pretty much how we sail these boats. It's like bursts of speed and then back into a controlled mode. Really? I'd never realised that. And what's interesting looking at this now, your angles, you're getting a much lower angle, a much better angle away from the wind on the British. Well, I think what we initially did is out of the jibe, we, we arced it up to go fast initially, got the apparent wind forward. Then we started closing the leech on the wing, jacking the height up. And the less drag you have, because you fly higher, you can see here in this shot here, we're definitely flying higher than them. It allows you just to keep taking it down and down. And, um, the thing is, is as we got further down the race course, the waves start to get bigger. So you can push it at the top of the course, but as you get down the course, you've got to start lowering the boat because you don't want those big sideways slips where you um, end up crashing down. You were up to a meter of ride height there. Looking at the data on the screen in front of us now though, Nobo, the one that stands out for me is the ride time, 99%. I'm guessing in your book, that's, that's a successful 
percentage. Yeah, definitely, definitely 99 is a big number, I think. And then um, also uh, the biggest, the right talking about the right time, it's maneuvering is another key thing. And then we had a good uh, jiving mode in this uh, event, I think, I remember. So uh, especially jiving is pretty good. So uh, we had a confidence about it, which is, you know, make, you know, our life easier, I guess. Okay, you've got, you've got a big lead at this point. Um, what are you thinking here, Nath? Because you, you've seen how quickly it's changed, but the speed, we can see it now, it's come down to just 14 knots. This must be excruciating. Yeah, at this point, you know, you're going around the last mark. This is the final upwind to that, that middle mark with the left turn to the finish. And so I turn around and you see everyone's following you. So you're instantly happy because, you know, they can't pass you if they follow you. And I just keep checking over my shoulder to try and work out who's going to attack when. And, and we knew at this point, you know, the British are having a great day, but the Australians, you know, are probably the main ones we should be concerned about for the overall. And so we're, you know, the further we go to the boundary, the happier we are. But when everyone starts tacking, you know, we get to the boundary and tack first. So you can see here, you know, we're, we're all of a sudden into, you know, managing the boats behind us. And what the race software shows you is um, can you make it to the next mark with two tacks or are you going to have to do four? And, and on this particular race, if we went boundary to boundary and start a very high mode, you'd just scrape into it. But the moment the Australians tacked early, we thought, okay, well, they're going to go for four, so we're going to go for four with them. And if the British happen to make it in two, we might lose the lead, but at least we've got the Australians tucked away. So, you know, the Americans here tacked out early too. So there's still a really good race on for the top four, but, you know, we're in the, in the box seat and we're just, you go into fleet management on that final lap trying to use the software and use your eyes with the with the wind to work out what's going to be better to sail faster with more tax or to sail a compromised mode like the british are here and try and do it in two and i mean you you talk about the maneuvers there what's fascinating about the f50 is that you guys are doing 20 odd knots through attack. It's, you're not compromising with a maneuver that much, are you? Well, unfortunately, that one they just showed there was, was probably our worst tack of the race. But yeah, if, 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 you, if you do a good tack and um, yeah, you know, our fly time went down to 98% there. But um, yeah, if you if you do good tacks, you 21, 22 bottom speed, no problems, which is is really quick but um and that's the thing when you're confident in your handling and you're tacking and jibing you don't mind throwing the extra maneuvers in there to to maintain your you know cover on the fleet whereas if you're not as good at maneuvering you often try to go more boundary to boundary it was interesting though but if you looked at the event post san francisco certainly the wind and the consistency of the wind at this venue offered a really really strong uh consistency to all of the maneuvers as well it flattered a lot of the teams didn't it it seemed to help them yeah i think the uh that's the san fran is a perfect con you know the venue for all of the maneuver and it's the straight line thing and other money uh, other venue is really hard to analyze even so uh it's so puffy so you know unpredictable thing is happening so this is sort of perfect uh venue for the all of uh, you know the racing and then performance wise in you know, analyze wise it's really a perfect uh venue okay on to the final leg now naif and and tom managed to put a bit of pressure on you there coming into that last mark rounding yeah well as i said you know we kind of identified they're the, they're the team to beat especially after sydney so we were just trying to stay between him and the finish so we, we gave up a bit of our lead to ensure that we we didn't get it let him get past and um you know, as I was saying before, you know, we took the extra maneuvers with the Australians and the British went for the the two tacks and it actually hurt them quite a bit in the end. But, you know, Tom was going very quick in this event and on this day, but um, just wasn't getting off the start line well enough and, you know, was having to come back through the fleet. So when you, you get around that mark one in front, um, you know, it's generally pretty easy to stay there. And as you can see, the British were the ones who really lost out here. They went from first or in the first lap second and then dropped to fourth and uh, i think that was that race there was what cost them you know making that match race final in the end 
Um, from your perspective, Nobo, if we look at the bigger picture of the F50, your background is in design. How does it change the fact that you're, you can't actually, you've got this one design boat now that everyone shares. How does it affect how you approach the data and what you can do with the boat now that you're hemmed in on the design front? Yeah, I, uh, to be honest, I, I'm more more analysis type of guy. So it was, you know, uh, I, you know, um, analyze and make both good make both faster is that my role I think has been and then in that sense uh, the you know uh, f50 is perfect boat but at the same time uh, the f format is really hard for me because the really limited amount of time on the water and then um, really limited time preparation so it's almost race 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 mode so it's hard to uh, how do you say make the really solid conclusion out of data which is uh, challenging well congratulations gentlemen it was a fantastic race uh, leo let's start with you from your perspective one of the key things that we saw in that race was the elevated ride height of the japanese f50 it was i think around 20 centimeters higher out of the water than everyone else what does that extra ride height do for the boat? What does it mean in basic terms? Yeah, so I mean, the ride height is, um, you know, obviously how how high we are flying out of the water. And uh, through a flight controller perspective, we have uh, many, many displays or many, many sensors on board that show us show us how high we are actually out of the water on the foils. So um, what it does is, you know, we can it means we can sail the boat faster, obviously, at a more, um, you know, dangerous, uh, dangerous, um, a mode as a, we are flying higher and things can go wrong if if we do fly too high but uh parko did a very good job there of uh, flying the boat at a perfect height but not having any um sketchy um you know uh, wobbles or you know on the foils so i think once the once the race progressed and we started flying higher and uh, you saw that the boat started getting more locked in and comfortable parko kept going higher and higher to see how how far he can go and that's when you can start seeing the notice of you know us flying higher and uh, that's probably why we were able to go uh, faster uh, because there was less drag in the water so yeah, that's probably why we were able to go faster and uh, take that race out from your perspective you started you were grinder in that race but for season two you've inherited the flight controller's position from luke parkinson and he's set quite literally a very high bar how do you go about chasing that when there's so much at stake it's a risky position yeah, it's pretty risky, and, and for me being quite young and, and sailing these expensive boats, it's a, it's a scary uh, thing to do. But however, um, you know, just learning from Parco and how he uh, uh, approached it every day, he he kind of took it really easily at the at the start of the day. He flew up, he flew the boat really low and safe, and then as he got more and more comfortable, he started flying the boat higher and higher. And then sometimes we found the limit, and uh, that's when he knew when to stop. So that's how I approached it in uh, my first event in Sydney and. You know, from then on, I'm just trying to, um, you know, improve because obviously if you do fly the boat higher, it's going to be more dangerous, but you are going to go faster. So obviously that's where you want to be. But uh, yeah, for now, we'll just um, keep taking it easier and easier and just get my confidence higher as uh, we get the season going. Okay. Uh, Nate, from your perspective, what was yours and Nobu's big takeaway from San Francisco in terms of the data? Was it that the ride height was working for you? I think the biggest takeaway we took probably out of Sydney was that we weren't flying high enough, we weren't pushing it enough. So when we went to San Francisco, that was one of our biggest goals. And I think it's like that in any kind of racing sport where you, you can't sprint a marathon forever. So you've got to have spurts of energy and speed and then just lock in your position. And that's what Nobu was really helping us with with the data is helping all of us as a team learn where those limits were. That's fascinating. And from your perspective, Leo, you've had one race in, well, one event, uh, six races in the, five races in the flight controller's seat. How does it work for you? How much of it is data driven? How much are you learning on shore? And then how much of it is the touch and feel of the boat itself? Do those two balance each other out for learning? For sure, you know, it's we have, um, you know, lots of information from Parco from last season. So I've been reading up on all of those. And obviously the data from the after after the event helps out and getting ready for the training sessions for the, the event after that. So um, it was a shame we couldn't get to San Fran. But for me, the big learnings 
were on the boat straightforward um the feel of the boat that's when i made the most learnings but then every every day in the debrief i would um look at all the information that nobu would send through and i'll be able to look at all the, the different button presses or the ride heights or you know the, what the rudders were doing and then i was able to you know make the, the changes for the next day and then have a good feel on the boat and try different things so that's what how the data helped me you know for my job in sydney as a flight controller but uh, for sure, you know, Nobu, um, being able to have Nobu every night um, sending information was really helpful. And that helps Nath, Aiden, and myself in um, making big changes, key changes for the, for the race or for the, the next training session coming forward. Okay. Uh, we've, we've done a bit of analyzing of the data as well, Nath, from San Francisco. And there was one piece that stood out massively for me. It was that your lowest speed through attack was 21 knots. I mean, that's an incredibly fast speed. And when, when you start applying that to the rest of the race, that's going to change tactics, isn't it? Because if you're not actually slowing down that much through the maneuvers, then the entire strategy changes you're not expecting well people can accelerate into different areas of the course yeah you know one of the biggest things we really wanted to do is you know can improve our tech consistency and so again we have a, a like a system that nobu works on with us um to analyze all that tacking and um you know what looks great on TV, you know, a foiling tack where the boat doesn't touch, not always is the fastest tack because um, to keep the platform in the air, you've got to use a lot of rake adjustment. There's a lot of um, drag if you really push that foil hard to keep it in the air. Sometimes the best way to tack is just to like come through and just let the, the lured hull on the exit just touch. And as the boat speed builds again, you can take off. So. You know, we would have done 50 to 70 tacks in training every day in the lead up to San Francisco. And we'd ask Nobu every day, every evening, analyze our tacks, give us, you know, what our average tack loss is. We look a lot at bottom speed because I think that's a really important factor. And he did the same for the other top teams. We, you know, the Aussies were obviously a target for us to learn how they were tacking in comparison. And actually the British and the Americans were tacking very well there too. Leo, for you, when you get off the water, how do you deal with the debriefs? Are you handed an enormous slab of data to pick through or is it drip fed to you and you're looking at um, the, those key points that you want to start with before you dig into the data? Yeah, the big thing about um, being on the water was we'd always share information of what we were feeling straight away onto the chase boat. So. Emmett, our coach, would um, dot all those notes down, and he'll take a different. He'll take timestamps of what what happened. So if I say that you know there was something um, about this tack that I wanted to look at the data, he would write down the time of what that happened, and then he would uh, put that in his notes, and then he'll send that straight to Nobu to analyze or look at the real time data to analyze. So as soon as we get back in, we just look at all the notes and look through all those timestamps and see what happened in those individual tacks where, you know, I may have pushed the, the, um, the buttons wrong or too fast. So that's when we can analyze. And in the debriefs, um, I'm more of just taking on information at first and then kind of sharing what I was feeling during the day. So, you know, we'd run through all the maneuvers that we would like to look at. And then, you know, obviously taking all the information, look at the data, and then obviously we'd make the adjustments for the next day. So that's how I kind of looked at the, uh, the debriefs. There wasn't too much information because you know the, the days were really long out in sydney because we were trying to make the maximize the time of trainings so you know the debriefs weren't too heavy so i was able to you know not take to not taking too much information because i just didn't want to overthink the the data and the, the job the, the the data too seriously otherwise i'll just get um my brain will probably just get too fried <laughs> to be honest so no, the, the way we handle the debriefs are really good. We've only got a little bit of time left. So last question for you, Leo. Um, you're obviously stepping up. There's a lot of pressure on you as flight controller compared to grinder. You've got to develop some level of telepathy with Nathan. Uh, and, and I mean, there's, there's strategy starts to come into it as well. How are you finding that, that upskilling responsibility? 
Yeah, so um, well, when we all had um, when we all left Sydney, we all had a bit of uh, homework to do, and I don't know uh, the teacher hasn't really uh, asked for the homework yet. So um, we've been uh, look, we we got uh, we all individually got asked to look at some data, and um, yeah, we all had to do a little homework task on um, on a, on, a, on a few things from Sydney. So we've all been doing that, but uh, Nathan and Emmett haven't um, asked for those back yet. So. I'm still uh, counting my chances. No, it's been good um, for me. It's all about <laughs> gelling with the team. Uh, we know obviously Nathan and I have only sailed for a year and a bit, but you know, uh, living in New Zealand helps, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> I've seen him, uh, you know, most days on, on his on his wing sail, and you know, we've we've uh, I've taken him sailing on the GC32 in New Zealand as well. So, you know, just um, a few things like that helps the help the help the uh, communication and getting used to each other, I guess. So little things like that. And for me, I'm just, you know, trying to spend as much time foiling or uh, I recently also bought Nathan's old moth as well. So um, he's been teaching me how to sell that a little bit. And I've been uh, learning a few few things myself on that as well. So it's all, it all translates back to the, you know, different aspects of flying the boat and, you know, doing it myself as well. And then steering as well, which is completely, completely different to what I've, I've done done before so um that's the kind of learning I've been doing and hopefully you know when we all get back onto the F50 I can translate those new skills into the boat and how I fly the boat and how uh, Nathan and I communicate as well so it'll be good that's going to be interesting okay thank you both so so much this has been truly insightful as always um I wish you all both the very best and I look forward to seeing you as soon as sail GP restarts uh, thank you very much, gents. Some truly brilliant racing there, matched, it's got to be said, by some fascinating insight from Nathan, Leo and Nobu. So huge thank you to them for letting us into that world for just a little bit. Uh, if you want to watch more Sail GP races, then you can. All you have to do is download the Sail GP app, either from the App Store or from Google Play, and you'll find the entire archive on the app there. If you want to find out more about the Oracle Cloud, you can do just go to oracle.com forward slash cloud. And don't forget to join us for our final episode of Winning Calls, when we'll be joined by the season one champions, the Australian Sail GP team. If you want to register for that so that you don't miss it, you can use the resources tool at the bottom of the screen. Right now, though, thank you for joining us on Winning Calls with Oracle.